I'm actually very grateful to God to be here today because every single day that I wake up and look out of the window, see the sun, I'm grateful to be alive. I wasn't always like this, I have to be very honest. For the first um, 28 years of my life, I went through life blithely and happily. And like every properly empowered girl who was educated and had information at my fingertips, I had a plan for everything in my life. And so I was always prepared for everything in my life. And as a result, life actually went quite well. But one day in December 1991, my life collided with the lives of so many other African women and children where something happened to me that I didn't plan for and I couldn't plan for. And it opened my eyes to the other side. I was 28 weeks and three days pregnant. And I was also getting married, actually. So I had, um, everybody was around, the hairdressers, the makeup artists. But I started to bleed. And my feet started to swell. So I was rushed to hospital, in a very good hospital at that, in my country. And I was told that I would be fine if I rested. So I tried to rest for that night. But at about 1 a.m., it became quite clear that no amount of rest was going to stop the inevitable. And I felt like going to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom. And when I got up, I couldn't put my legs back together. And it was like a balloon, like a wet balloon was coming out. So I screamed. And the nurses and midwives ran into the bathroom and carried me spread eagled to the labor room. This is where all the planning I had done just it wasn't following the sequence that I was expecting. So I was asking, you know, no, 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 no. You know, I'm only 28 weeks. It's 12 weeks early. I can't deliver. And they said, just push. And I said, but I can't push. You know, this is very premature because I had gone to birth preparedness classes and I knew what I needed. So I started begging, actually. Please, can I quickly have steroid injections, beta methasone? So they said, okay, okay. And they quickly gave me the first one. And then the second one. And they said, no, you just have to push. So I pushed. In fact, I remember I was turning and waiting for the epidural. And they asked me, the midwives and my doctors, why are you turning your back? You know, heaving my back is more like it because turning doesn't describe what I was doing properly. And I said, oh, for the epidural. And they said, there's no epidural here. Just push. Mm -hmm. So I pushed. And the first baby came out very tiny, 1.2 kilos very weak cry and I remember I was praying when she came out I was praying the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want because when you have nothing else you turn to God and um, I heard a tiny little cry and they took her and then they said keep pushing because I was expecting twins and I guess at the time I felt what happened to me only happened to me but later in years, I've realized it happens to hundreds and thousands of women where my womb began to contract and the second twin became stuck sideways. And so for that 20 minutes while I was pushing and they were hunting for an anesthetist and I lost my second twin as a stillbirth. And then I almost lost my own life because of the delays by the time the anesthetist came and put me out and they, you know, cut me open and brought out the baby and then postpartum hemorrhage, blood pressure. I was anemic. And by the time I woke up the next morning, I remember they had put my bridal veil over the bed for the registrar to come and do the wedding in um, the hospital. And I also remember, actually, that the nurses were so excited at all the dignitaries that they went to escort the dignitaries and forgot me <laughs> in the room. But the next few weeks were tough. I saw everything, you know, trying to get the breast milk out. My baby's heart was stopping. I was bleeding. We were looking for premature baby formula when I couldn't get my milk going. There was a day that her heart stopped and 
we just didn't have the equipment. And I used to sit next to the incubator just praying and praying to her and just everything at my disposal. But I was reaching out around the world because I could. And so I heard, okay, there's a drug called digoxin, pediatric digoxin. It helps children with a hole in their heart. It helps that to close. So I ordered some. Somebody flew it out for me on their jet. And when all that was over and I was going home, I actually went home a month before my baby. I remember they put into my hand two envelopes. One was a birth certificate for my child that survived. And that was written with my husband's name. And the second one was a death certificate for my child that died. And that was written with my name. And so I wondered, how did you choose which name to give? You gave me the dead child and you gave my husband the live one. But these were little, little things that were sticking in my brain. And I was praying to God, just let this child survive. If this child survives, I will do all in my power. And as small as I was, I had considerable power because I did have wealth and I had education and I had connections. I will do what is in my power to help those who don't because I was imagining what happens to those who don't have what I have. I remember three days before I left the hospital, some people, the hospital where I had my baby, it's not in a wealthy area, it's in a downtown area, but it's a very good hospital. And they brought one tiny little premature baby just like mine. Somebody in the area had had a baby. And it came, the father rushed the baby to the hospital, still with the umbilical cord and bleeding. And the hospital wanted to turn the child away because it was an expensive hospital. But I happened to be just coming out because I had gone to express my bread and breast milk. So I said, no, 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 please let the child come. I will pay for the child. So the child was taken to the skibu where my baby was. Because I knew I was supposed to have two anyway, so I was kind of prepared to pay for two. And um, so the baby survived. They were looking after the baby, and the baby was growing up alongside mine. You know, every day you do the weights and the measurements and everything. And when my baby survived and I took my baby home, I was actually very scared to tell people that I had taken her home because... She was still a month to her due date. So people would come and visit me, and I could see the confusion in their eyes. You know, I'm a Yoruba by tribe, and they say, we Yorubas, we have a greeting for everything. You know, if you are the mother of a young girl who has just had a baby, they greet you, ekwawonumi, which means we are greeting you because your hands are in water, because when you're helping your daughter who's just had a baby, you're constantly washing your hands. But I could see that people would visit me and they didn't know how to greet me. They didn't know whether to congratulate me on my wedding. They didn't know whether to congratulate me on my child that survived. They didn't know even how to greet me on my child that died as a stillbirth because nobody was counting stillbirths. And so I would see the confusion in their eyes and I would sit with them for a few minutes and then just go back upstairs and pray for my child and try and feed her a bit more. But then, fast forward 14, 15 years, my husband became, he ran for election and became a governor. And so for all my years of saying, you know, political will and, you know, these are our leaders, <laughs> I suddenly found myself married to one. <laughs> and I began to see that it wasn't just me. This was a daily reality. I was being called to congratulate women who had delivered. And three days later, they would be dead. And so I was beginning to put programs together. And I thought, no, this cannot be right. We have so many of our women and children dying. The first day, the first hour, the first eight seconds, the first year. So I um, stormed the Federal Ministry of Health. I did ask for an appointment. And I said, we have a national emergency. Please, where's the data? This can't just be in my husband's state. If this happened to me 22 years ago, 
and it's still happening now, we need to do something about it. And that was how I began to partner with the federal ministry and with state governments. That was how I came to write the integrated maternal, newborn and child health record, because I felt very strongly that we couldn't divorce the health of the baby from the health of the mother. I also felt very strongly that we had to actually embrace the truth of our challenges. We had to register pregnant women first before we could even talk of registering the birth. We had to register how many times they went to hospital. The minimum time prescribed is four, and we needed laws. I personally advocated for the passage of the Choir State Safe Maternity Services Act, which made it mandatory for a woman to have the regulation for visits, but also actually made it mandatory for the government to put a certain level of equipment in hospitals that call themselves delivery suites. It's been a long journey, but literally, I just want to close with one thing. The one thing that makes this battle worth it for every newborn is for us just to know that all this work that we are all doing, everyone, every child, every newborn action plan, the Lancet, the midwives, even the individual mothers, like the work I'm doing with McCann to make the mothers become partners in their own care. I just want us to measure how long we have when a child is born, to save that child's life. So please just hold your breaths and let me count so that we know the urgency. On the count of three, please hold your breath. One, two, three. Now keep your breaths held while I count. One, two, three. The first person who gives up can put their hand on. Four, five, six, six. Six seconds. All the work we're doing is to gather everything we need for that vital six seconds. Thank you.